leaving teaching for something new. Uh, that is the title of today's webinar. It is the first in an eight webinar series that the Teaching a Path to L&D put on. We do this in the spring and we do this in the fall. This is the second round that we've had of this, so um, hopefully it's better than the first. The first went okay, so only up to go from here. Hi, I'm Sarah Stevick. Um, and what are we going to be talking about today? So first, I'll just kind of give a brief introduction about who we are, who I am, like who's this lady? <laughs> so we're talking about that a little bit. Then we're going to talk about some different options for you. We have learning and development options. These are mainly corporate, but it could be higher ed options that you could pursue after teaching um, that are related to the jobs skill set that you already have, but they're not necessarily within the K-12 or um, adjunct realm. Then there's the education-related jobs. These are going to be more closely related to school, so if you're not quite ready to explore outside of the school setting, the education setting, there are some uh, stepping stones that you can take, or maybe you're just ready to explore a different option within the school settings. And then we have completely unrelated to education options. I'm ready to leave all this behind me. Please tell me what else there is out there that has nothing to do with teaching at all ever during the day. All of these are fine. We're going to go over a few of them. This is not the end all be all, okay? If, if I were to tell you every job out there, oh my gosh, we'd be here for days. Um, you can always look up more by going uh, to different career websites. Um, so I think in Virginia it's the C, oh gosh. If you look up career clusters, it'll take you to different career websites. Um, and you can look up what are some jobs that are related to different things, career clusters, yeah, that are related to different things that I am good at or what I have interests in, and you can read all about different job descriptions, how much it pays, what types of educations you would need for that, and it's a very valuable tool to use when you're thinking about pursuing a new job. And then we're going to go over some additional resources. I'm going to give you all a checklist that you can use if you would like. It's fully customizable. It is, uh, of course, free. Everything, everything that I give and do is free. Um, and we'll talk about that too. And then we're going to save some time for questions at the end. And if you need, like I said, if you need to go throughout, I understand. Happy to have had you here for the time that you were here. We're happy to stay late and answer questions too. So we're just excited to be here with you and get started. Okay, so we have our next Poll Everywhere question. Which statement most closely aligns with your current thoughts? A. I'm excited to do something with my education background, but I want to focus on going corporate. B, I'm not quite ready to leave the education realm yet, and I'm looking for a way to stay in K-12 slash higher ed, but in a different capacity. C, get me out of anything related to education, please. D, I'm curious about what's out there, but I'm not looking to leave teaching anytime soon. Or E, none of the above. Again. It's anonymous. There are no wrong answers to this question. We here at Teaching a Path to L&D are here to support in an environment where you can be yourself and have the thoughts and the feelings that you go through when we think about this transition, which can be very scary and intimidating and also exciting and, and happy and freeing. Um, so you can answer them at pollev.com slash sarahstevic347 or if you text Sarah Stevick 347 to the number 22333, you can then just text A, B, C, or D, or E, and then it'll show up on the screen for your responses. All right, so it looks like so far we have mostly A, which is getting into corporate. We have some B, wanting to stay in K-12, but something a little different. Some people were just ready. It's like, it's time. Thank you. Goodbye. I had fun. It was great. I didn't have fun, but I'm ready to go. Okay, bye. And then um, curious about what's out there. We don't have any of those yet. 
or E, none of the above. If you are E and none of the above and you feel comfortable sharing in the chat, if you would, that would be great. Would love to hear a little bit more about that. Or I guess, Tyler, is that you? Are you E, Tyler? Oh, okay. Um, Tyler has already made the transition uh, as well from teaching. Tyler, what role are you in? I'm in an instructional designer role, but my official title is Senior Specialist Digital Learning. Yeah, that's a fun thing that you'll come to learn with all of these jobs, too, is they come with a whole bunch of different titles. Technically, I am an instructional designer like Tyler, but my official role is Senior Learning Associate. So, you know, they, they like to hide them in there, but keywords come out when you do your searches. All right. So... This is great. All of these places are absolutely perfect because you're always meant to be where you are at the current moment for whatever reason. I'm a firm believer of that. So who is this lady? Who am I? I am Sarah Stevick. I have a bachelor's degree in deaf education from Radford University. I graduated in 2011 and I taught for nine years, four of which um, I taught deaf education three at a residential school for the deaf and blind, one as an itinerant teacher, and then my last uh, five years teaching, I was a biology and anatomy physiology teacher. Within that time, I taught a whole bunch of different things from chemistry to English 9 through 12 to self-advocacy and career exploration and special... <laughs> I did a lot, and it was really exciting when I did that, and I enjoyed it very much. And last, no, I guess it's in 2019, that's how I need to start referring to things because all the years blend together with this pandemic. <laughs> in 2019, I started a new school year at a new school um, that was a rough experience. And in October, I was diagnosed with a bone tumor that caused me to have to go immediately on FMLA. I was out on FMLA for four months because I had to have the surgery and then I had to uh, wait for that to heal enough so that I could get back into the classroom. I went back into the classroom in February and unfortunately, as I'm sure some of you can probably relate to, I did not have the support that I needed in order to do my job effectively. I was essentially a babysitter and I could not guarantee my safety or the safety of the kids in my classroom. And I did something that was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do, which was I left in the middle of the school year. And I was the type of teacher that would get there at 6.30 in the morning. I would leave at 9 o'clock at night because I coached and I was the sponsor of X, Y, and Z clubs. And I was very dedicated, you know. Um, even after giving birth to my son in 2018, my fiance moved cross country and I stayed behind with the newborn baby by myself so I could finish out the school year. Okay. <laughs> and we had sold our house and I was living on my, living on my friend's, friend's couch with the baby in a bassinet next to me just so I could finish out the school year because that's what it meant to me. That's what I felt like I needed to do. I needed to be there for my children and I needed to sacrifice my life and, and you know, because that's what we're taught. That's what, what, where the emphasis is really put in education, right? And so that was the hardest decision I ever had to make was to leave, but it was either stay and risk um, losing the functionality of my arm and my hand, uh, or, or leave and take care of myself and my family. And, you know, something, it's, it still shocks me to this day that it took something like that for me to make the jump. Um, and I think we're all kind of a little bit in that position with the pandemic, you know, uh, it's, it's brought a lot to light. There have been a lot of stressors that haven't been present uh, in previous times. We've seen a lot of societal reactions that have been unfavorable, to say the least. Um, and so my point in telling you this is that was a really dark time in my life. 
I had to leave my job that I loved, that I identified as a teacher. That was who I was. It wasn't what I did. It was who I was. Um, it was something that I enjoyed, that I thought I would do forever, that um, I had to say goodbye to. And it, it, it was very hard. But since saying goodbye, I have to tell you, I've been immeasurably happy. Uh, my job is amazing. I'm appreciated every day. I love where I work. Um, and I just get to create and, and do my job and be respected for, for my job. And that's been amazing. I'm not saying that you have to leave teaching to achieve that. I did have teaching positions where I did feel that way, that I did feel that I could retire in. Um, but whatever you decide to do, it's okay. And you don't have to justify why you are leaving to anyone as long as it's the right thing for you and your family. Okay, so basically we started this group. It's called Teaching a Path to L&D. We support teachers for free looking to explore other options, looking for help with resumes and help with uh, portfolios if you're going into a role with portfolios. Uh, because we're of the mindset that teachers, having been teachers all ourselves, we know teachers give back every day, all the time, and we wanted to give back to them It was and to you guys as part of our community. And so everything we do is free. All of our workshops that we offer, all of our coaching sessions, all of our resume sessions, everything is free, can be accessed at uh, www.teachlearndev.org. And we really would love to have you as part of our community. People here who are part of that group can tell you how welcoming it is and how helpful it is to be able to be in such a collaborative space. So I am joined by Erin Chancellor. She is our Director of Marketing and Social Media for the group. And then we also have Heidi Kirby, who is our VP. And pretty much together, we, we run the ship. And that, but that doesn't mean we run it all by ourselves. We have a lot of great people who contribute to this cause, who want to give back. And uh, it's, it's a good time. So you, you're Sorry, not alone. Can I alone. jump in and say something real quick? Yes. I just wanted to say real quick that, um, so people like Tyler and um, a couple more like Chris today in the group, and of course, Sarah and Heidi, there's a lot of former instructional designers and former teachers that still come into the group and still help. So the whole initiative that's like totally pay it forward, it's a buy-in from everyone. So even people who have already gotten jobs, um, they're still in there participating and offering help and offering advice. So it's really cool. And, and we love having that. So if you're inspired and, and want to do the same, we'd love to have you as a contributor as well. Even if it's learning along your journey and just sharing, hey, I did this today, guys. You know, what did you do? That's great. We love having that. Um, so just wanted to let you know that's available to you. So let's dig in. Okay, learning and development options. So there's this beautiful wide field out there that I feel like we weren't really exposed to when we were in school and deciding, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? You know, everybody's, oh, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a teacher. There are certain roles that are just more public and there's a lot more awareness around. And learning and development has really grown over really the past 20 years into this amazing subculture that if you're not on LinkedIn, you got to get on LinkedIn. And I, I hear you as a teacher. <laughs> I made the LinkedIn. I was like, yeah, but I'm never on it. What is it really? You know, like uh, it's LinkedIn. Whole nother ball game in corporate. Let me tell you, this is like, I mean, it's like this underground club that's not underground that everybody seemed to know <laughs> but me. And I'm like, where has this been all my life? My fiance's like, are you on LinkedIn again? No, maybe. You know, it's okay. Uh, but it's great because you get to connect with professionals from your field. You get to take free webinars and you get free advice and you're just staying up to date in current trends and articles and it's, it's really cool. 
In addition to that, it's the place to find jobs, and we'll talk about that a little later on. But so you have options that are related to teaching, but that are not teaching. So the first one that we're going to talk about is a learning consultant. Now, the information that I'm going to share with you can be found on mostly Glassdoor, ZipRecruiter, Zippa, Salary.com. This is all freely available information that we pulled from the, the interweb right, to, to provide for you. So learning consultants, national average salary is $53,000. It is important to keep in mind that these do change regionally. And so if you are looking into any of the positions that we're going to talk about today, make sure that you Google salary average for whatever state that you are in so that you get a more accurate representation of the salary closer to where you are geographically. But a learning consultant is also called an educational consultant, and they help schools or businesses design curriculum and training programs that improve performance metrics for students or employees. As a learning consultant, you might collaborate with schools or uh, company stakeholders to develop relevant curriculum, identify useful resources, analyze performance metrics, and motivate students or employees to improve their performance. Some other responsibilities might include some training. You might be a facilitator for some training um, and also providing how to use best educational practices. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Hey, we do that. We do that every day as teachers, right? The difference is, is that you can actually do this in a corporate position. Some uh, learning consultants or educational consultants make quite a bit of money. Uh, they can make into the 80s and even up into the six figures. Um, I, On my team, I do have a learning consultant that I work with, and she makes pretty good money, and it's a pretty sweet gig. She doesn't have to grade any papers. She doesn't have to deal with parents. Uh, she just does her job, nine to five, and then she gets to go home and enjoy life. The next job that we're going to talk about is a corporate trainer. I'm sure some of you guys have probably heard about this uh, in wherever, right? Corporate trainer basically is just a facilitator. It's an instructor, but you aren't actually making the instructional materials that you're using for the most part. What you would be given would be created by a content developer or a learning experience designer slash instructional designer, which we'll get to in just a second. But basically, you show up, you say, hey, what am I teaching? And they're like, here you go. And you're like, great. And then you teach it, and then you go home. You don't have to grade nothing. You don't have to tutor. You don't have to do any of that extra stuff. Um, of course, if you wanted to, I'm sure that they could find something for you. But, you know, you, you could have some free time. That's something that people who don't teach have. And it's, it's this beautiful, shiny thing that you get to have after your workday is done just for you and your family. Um, instructional, <laughs> words are hard. instructional designer slash content developer. I do want to preface this. Oh, I'm sorry. Corporate trainer on average makes $54,000 a year. I do want to say right now with the pandemic, corporate trainers are kind of on the fence as far as need for them because a lot of things have been going more virtual or e-learnings. So, you know, make sure to do your research and see what the um, outlook looks for that in the next 10 years as far as trends in, in jobs. Instructional designer slash content developer. Excuse me. I love this one. It's something that a lot of teachers and a lot of people hear about as the next thing after teaching because it is a little bit more popular than some of the other roles. Um, what an instructional designer does is that they basically come up with the plan and design the creation of educational systems and of trainings and learning tools, instructional materials, job aids, whatnot, to be used for training in corporate. Or they can also work in higher ed as well. And that's what they do all day. You do something called a needs analysis, which is very similar to a pretest. 
Uh, it's a little bit more in-depth than that. There are more steps and, of course, some documentation that you would have to do. But so you do an analysis to determine the gap. And then this is the crazy part. This is how it's really very different from teaching. You're not expected to be the expert on what you're making the course for. You actually work with someone called subject matter experts. And the subject matter experts basically tell you all the content. You take that and you design the package that it goes into that is the best using best practices and learning methodologies to present it in a way that is best for learners, for adult learners, using adult learning theory. And so then that gets made, you implement it, and then, of course, you are going to evaluate how effective that training was. Now, the difference between an instructional designer and content developer, technically, <laughs> is that an instructional designer literally back in the day when everything was siloed and it was very linear, they literally just mapped it out. Oh, I think we'll make a e-learning here and it'll have this on the screen and they'll do this activity and we'll have these job aids that include these things that the subject matter expert told me. And then the instructional designer would literally just hand that off to the content developer and the content developer would work like a like a product machine, and they would just whip it all up and be like, ta-da, Harry Potter, right? And so that's technically the difference. In reality, out in the L&D wild, <laughs> that's not really what happens anymore. Most times there is a blend of roles. A lot of uh, learning and development slash what we call L&D roles are put out there by companies who know that they need training created, but may be newer to incorporating uh, in-house training so they don't actually have a full understanding of what role they're asking for. And so what they'll do is they'll copy and paste job descriptions from other companies and put them out there because they know that they want this person to do this. So what a lot of instructional designer roles or content developer roles are, they're actually a blend of the two, which we call learning experience designer, which does both. Tyler, would you agree with that? Very much so. <laughs> yeah. So while Tyler and I are instructional designers, our real job is probably a learning experience designer, but we're also called something completely different. Is that is that true, Tyler? Yeah, I find that a lot of the job Yeah. So it's it's starting to snowball. It's starting to become more all of the same thing. So that's where teachers are really well suited for this because we are used to doing everything and then like 80 million other jobs more. There is a learning curve to all of these jobs. However, none of these jobs on the screen require additional education. You can do these with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. You can get certified uh, as an instructional designer or corporate um, or a content developer. You do not have to. Only 46%, um, this is according to ATD, which is a, a professional organization, only 46% of instructional designers actually have a certificate in instructional design and only 16% have a degree in instructional design. Everybody else, they fell into it. So while you don't have to have those things, it can help on a resume to have an accredited course on your resume, such as the ATD certification or, you know, a master's degree or whatnot. That's not to say that they will necessarily be the most helpful in helping you develop the skills most a lot of these offer a lot of methodology versus application based um, so we really encourage you to do your research and we talk about that in later webinars if that's any interest to you the next jobs that we're going to discuss is a user experience design user experience designers on national oh 
I forgot to say the national average for instructional designers, content developers, silly me. It's uh, 80,000 a year is national average for instructional designers. Um, so user experience designers, these on average make 77.5 a year. And a user experience designer looks at all the elements of a user-based website or a digital experience, like a, a learning course that you go through, and basically does a lot of research and surveying of what the user experiences, and then comes up with strategies in order to improve upon their experience and put out an end result. They work with content strategists, developers, and managers to create a wireframe. They plan the elements of design or a storybook, and then they create a new experience for testing. If you are a person who's really research-based and likes to work with people and figure out what makes them tick, this might be a really good option for you. Um, if you're a person who really likes to make things but not necessarily like give it to people, that's instructional design or content development. If you really love the aha moment and seeing people learn, that's more of a corporate trainer, might resonate more with you. Okay, so a learning consultant, that's if you love the whole spectrum of it. It's almost like a curriculum developer um, or you know, a curriculum specialist within a school. Right, you map it all out, you pull it together, you provide best practices, and you're kind of like a jack of all trades managing the overall scope. Um, next thing we have is an educational tech sales rep. This is like, we all know them, we've seen them before when we do textbook adoptions, Pearson and McGraw-Hill, Discovery, right? Or Gizmos, and they come and they sell their products and they help with figuring out what learning products provide solutions for their customers. They make on average uh, 86000 a year. Now remember, that's a sales position. So it does depend on how well you're able to sell stuff. Um, the next one is a standardized test developer. I know we all love those, <laughs> but somebody has to write them. And I did find somewhere that this was like, 60,000, the one job that I, you know, found for it, but national average, couldn't tell you. But basically, you write, you write test questions. Yeah. And that's, that's it. That's, that's the jam. So these are learning and development options. I'm going to pause there for some quick questions. Um, so Sarah, we had a question about going back to getting a, a, another degree. Um, for instructional design, and the question was, would you recommend getting both a master's degree or the ATD credit um, credential and experience through developing a portfolio, or one or the other? Both together, apart, what do you think? Personally, it depends. Uh, it's important that you ask yourself, what is your end goal of pursuing whatever additional education it is? Is it A, to learn new things? just on your own? Is it to B, make your resume look better? Is it to C, be a collector? You know, what? what is your intent of going after these things, right? If you want to know more about the methodology and grow that way and have something that's really nice for your resume that holds a lot of weight, a master's degree might be a good option. Does it hold the same amount of weight that a master's degree would hold in education, it doesn't. But it still looks good. A certificate would be more of a resume enhancement. It, uh, the ATD one specifically, especially for teachers, it has a lot of the methodologies that we are familiar with and not as much of the practical application that we would want to uh, upskill with because there is a skill gap, okay? There is a skill gap from teaching to instructional design or any of these roles that you would have to fill. How you choose to fill that is up to you. And we'll talk about that here in the next couple of slides, but you could pursue a degree. You could pursue a couple different certificate programs. You could pursue one-offs, like uh, going specifically to a workshop on how to use this tool or learning about this methodology. 
I'm a huge proponent of LinkedIn Learning because you get a whole month for free. After that, it's $30 a month. You can take as many as you like. You can learn about whatever you want to learn. And as teachers, we're used to self-teaching ourselves, right? We've had to stay up to date and learn new things about what we're teaching in order to stay on trend and, and all that. So in the end, it's how you learn best. Do you need the accountability and the support of a formal program? If not, you can do this by yourself and you can do it for a very decent price. And we'll get into that. Great question. What about Sarah? Um, what would you think about having, I guess, Sarah and Tyler too? Um, how do you feel about an ID role being a good fit for an introvert? For someone who likes designing and developing curriculum but not necessarily presenting it? I think it's good for not presenting it, but I'm not, you would have to interact a lot with stakeholders and with subject matter experts in order to create the content because you don't know it and you, because you are not the one who is really identifying the business goal or objective, you're going to have to work with the individuals who are doing those things so that you can make your end product. But if you are not really a, like you, if you're a person who loves to make like the PowerPoint or the slide deck and like all the fun worksheets and hands-on manipulatives and all that stuff, this is a great job for you. Trust me, because I love that stuff and that's what I love about this job. Um, I do miss the teaching part a little bit, but I, I feel that with, with what I do here with you guys. So um, that's what I would say to that. Our, uh, I do see a question in the chat about are LinkedIn learnings enough to secure a job? For me, yes, it was. When I left teaching, I didn't have money to go for another degree or certificate. I self-taught myself everything from LinkedIn, from reading articles, from connecting with people, and through a lot of trial and error. And my I interviewed in technically March, April, but then the job went away. And then I interviewed for a different role, same company in May, and I started my job in July. So from February, never hurting, hurting, gee, many crickets. From February, never hurting, no, no, no. <sighs> It's Thursday, y'all. It's Little Friday. Um, Friday Junior. <laughs> right? Friday Junior. Uh, so from never having heard of instructional design before in February to having a job in July from LinkedIn Learning, yes. But I will not lie to you. It was a full-time job that entire time, upskilling. I devoted hours of my week to taking LinkedIn learnings. I would write it all down. I would make sure that I had conversations about it and I told other people about it so I knew that I understood what I was doing. Um, it's just as much work. You just do it by yourself. That's what I would say about it. Great questions. Um, okay, so we will come back to more questions in a couple minutes. Education related options. You probably know about some of these, but let's talk about them anyway. Administrator, I know we're all dying to get into that position. <laughs> they put out a lot of fires. They uh, make a national average of 66000 a year, depending on how many fires they have to put out and where they have to put out those fires. Um, I, I, I've had some really great administrators, but I did not envy that position. But it is a great uh, avenue to explore. If you want to interact with parents and students and teachers, as well as local politicians and members of the public and be involved in developing and instituting curriculums and guidelines and interdisciplinary studies and, and all that stuff that we're just, sounds really great for administrators. So if that sounds like something that you would like to pursue, that's amazing. If not, that's okay too. There's also educational uh, program Directors slash instructional coordinators slash curriculum coordinators. All of these kind of fall under the same umbrella. Uh, one of the differences being that uh, as a program director, you could do that technically outside of a educational setting in a more corporate setting um, or a nonprofit setting. They, on average, make 47000 a year. 
and they oversee the development and implementation of curriculum and educational programs at a school. You would monitor and evaluate teachers on their effectiveness in the classroom, provide trainings on the latest instructional materials, and basically just be on the other side of teaching, right? You would still be collecting all of the curriculum and providing those as options for the teacher, but you wouldn't be teaching. You do need a master's degree for that, so if you are wanting to pursue that, you would have to get a master's degree in that uh, in order to continue on. A great option that I know a lot of you have heard of before are the virtual educators through something like VipKid. They pay 14 to 22 an hour, depending on your experience. There's also programs like OutSchool, where you get to develop your own curriculum, and you basically sell that to whoever wants to come to your classes. You could also do community programs if you wanted. If you are, uh, for example, if I... I know sign language, I could do a basic introductory sign language class if I wanted to sell that to the community and say, hey, I'm willing to teach you, this is how much the class costs. You could go out and become your own entrepreneur. There's, there's nothing stopping you from using that knowledge base that you have. Um, you could be an adult educator. This is, you know, pretty cool. On average, they make about what a teacher makes, you know, 39000 to 42000 um, and a person in this role facilitates instruction to adults. Sometimes their curriculum is provided by others. Other times they have to create it. A lot of these can be like GED courses. They could be English, lang lang English language learner courses. There we go. And parenting and anything in between. Okay. Uh, it could be a yoga class. Yeah. Yoga instructor sounds nice. Doesn't that sound relaxing? You get to like meditate and listen to music and stretch. That's good. Um, curriculum sales rep. This is very, this is the same thing as an educational sales rep. We've already kind of talked about it. I thought I'd replace that one. Whoops, but that's okay. And private tutor, which, you know, you can set your own prices. Right now I've seen everything from 18 an hour to 50 an hour, which is pretty good. It depends what you know. If you're if you're a math or science person, you could probably charge or I mean reading, I mean reading's always in in need, right? So it offers great flexibility if you're looking for that type of option as well. Any questions before we move on to unrelated options? Yes, I have one question, and before that, um, there's a really good point brought up in the chat box about LinkedIn Learning being, um, having free access at a lot of public libraries, so check that out. Thank you, David. Um, and so the other, another question, the one before that, going back, which role would you recommend for introverts out of the ones that you've described? Probably not sales rep. Mm, no, probably not no. sales rep. Uh, I mean, Tyler, what do you think? Yeah, I don't think I would do anything in sales. I have a lot of people, uh, a lot of respect for people who, who do sales, but that's I, I think it's too far away from being a teacher. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, as an instructional designer, I get to put my head down and do my stuff all day, but I do have to talk to people. Like, there's. I have to talk to people, <laughs> but I like that part because I'm a chatty cat. There's a lot of like jack of all trades stuff with um, with instructional design. There are there are jobs of instructional design jobs out there where they want you to have experience and training. Yeah, it really does depend on on the job description. If you can find something that is a true content developer where you're just making the stuff, that would probably be best. But that you're going to narrow down your, your options pretty quickly. Okay. Was there any other ones? Um, no, that's good. It looks like all the lynda.com and, you know, LinkedIn Learning and Public Library stuff going on in the chat box. Everyone's getting answers there. Excellent, excellent. Make sure if you are using those options that you download the certificate that you get from it um, so that you can keep that for your records, email it to yourself, 
just so that you have the actual paper trail because I think some of them don't let you add it to your actual LinkedIn profile in the same way. So that's just something to be aware of. All right, unrelated education options. You could be a life coach or career coach. If you are not an introvert and you really like to uh, connect with people and bring people together, this requires a lot of uh, social media interaction to really build your clientele base. They make about $60,000 a year. Um, and you basically attempt to just coach them through difficulties in their life. You're not trying to solve their problems, you're just giving them options that they could take. You could become a recreation director if you're somebody who loves the outdoors, who maybe coaches a lot, or you know, PE teacher, that kind of thing. Um, recreation directors, they make about 42,000 on average, and they manage special interest programs like sports and games and hobbies, like canoeing and rock climbing and camping for like the YMCA or the uh, Boys and Girls Club, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, that kind of stuff. Uh, you could also be an HR specialist slash recruiter. They make about 49,000 on average and they recruit, screen, and place workers. They also handle employee relations and compensation and benefits and training. None of these need additional schooling or certification. Although you can get certification in career coaching, but it's not required. Project managers, I, a lot of teachers gravitate towards this one because it's something that we're used to doing. We're used to getting all of our little duckies in a row and making sure that they all do what they need to do from A to B to get that end result, right? Project managers make on average $78,000 a year and they coordinate tasks to complete a plan of action for their employers. They generally work on a team and they oversee the production from the planning stages all the way through completion. Companies typically have project managers on staff, but some may contract out, a lot of contract positions there. And so you might do things like create plans, delegate responsibilities, supervise employees, uh, actually implement the project and kind of keep tabs on how the project is going. Executive assistant, the only difference between an executive assistant and an administrative assistant is about 10 grand. No, I'm just, there's a little bit more of a difference. Uh, an administrative assistant is going to assist administrators, and then an executive assistant is going to assist executives. And so executives, because they are higher up, they do have a lot more on their schedule and a lot more that needs coordinated, so they get that 10 grand more a year. So that can go anywhere from 49,000 to 59,000 or up, depending on what company. And I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, the assistant to a CEO, you're gonna make good money. You might not have much of a life, but you're gonna make real good money. Uh, and so what they do is they provide administrative support, this includes clerical duties, such as answering the phone, taking messages, directing calls, welcoming visitors, scheduling meetings, and the list goes on and on. It's what we dream about during the teaching day. Man, it would be so nice to just answer a phone and schedule something in the Google Calendar, right? Uh, it's like that, but there's a lot more to it, of course. Now, hear me out with this last one, okay? Just, just hear me out private nanny. So a nanny plays a very special role in children's lives. They get to work with one family or a few families as they, they grow up, right? I will tell you where I live in Virginia. When the pandemic started, I called a nannying service. I have one at the time, he was 18 months old. He's, he's two in a few months now. One little boy. Do you know how much, how much they wanted a week? $826 a week for one kid. So imagine if I had four of those little rascals running around. I'd pay much more than that, right? And we can totally handle four kids because you know, 
we've had to deal with hordes of them. So, you know, four, no problem. I'm not going to lie to you. That's marginally less than I made as a teacher after nine years of teaching, like marginally. You don't need any further education either. It's a bonus if you speak more than one language. They love that. Okay, so if you're looking for something as an in-between, let's say you're, I, I know I did see some people that said, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about the unemployment. I hear that. I, I totally hear that. But if you're ready to get out and you just need an interim, shoot, go nanny for a bit. Like, whew, and they'll be like, oh my gosh, a former teacher, we're going to hire you right away. Yeah. And um, I actually worked with, when I was in Arizona, I worked with a teacher who took a $10,000 pay cut to come teach from nannying. So there's that. That's always an option. Okay. So, end of the day. I have a quick question for you, Sarah. No, I did not nanny. Is that it? Was that your question? <laughs> no. Okay. No. Um, it's about project manager and sure. whether or not uh, there, if there's a certification for project manager that would beef up a resume. Is there something for project manager? That's a really great question. I'm not 100% sure. I know that I know a lot of teachers who have made the transition into project management without further education, without a certificate. I'm sure there's a certificate. People try and bottle air and sell it on the side of the street. You know, like, they'll sell a certificate for anything. Does it mean that it means something? Eh, you know. <laughs> what matters, really what matters, is do you have the skill set? Can you show that you have the skill set with concrete examples, with a body of work that says, look, Yes, I have been this, but look at me and all my awesomeness and what I've done because I'm awesome and what I can do because we could be awesome together. Yeah, that's what I'd say to that. I don't know. Tyler, do you know? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll we really, so I, I think I'd, mention this, but I'm not sure if I did, so I'm going to say it just in case the CYA, <laughs> um, or CMA, cover my, anyway, um, this is all based on my experience and the experience of, of Heidi Kirby. This is not in any way a formal replacement. It is, this is what we have been through. This is what we have seen, what we have heard in helping others make their transitions. This is in no way uh, a replacement for any type of formalized training. It's just to provide options and to provide a place of support and information in a free and judgment-free zone, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Yes, there's also PMP. Is that a product manager, Kevin? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I've had, I know some IDs who have gotten their who have gotten their strong certifications too. That makes sense. Yeah, I've I've heard of some people going for their scrum, scrum stuff. So, but at the end of the day, your options are endless. We went over a few here, but as a teacher, we've really had to be adaptable. We've had to do things that were not in our job description. <laughs> And we did them just fine as they came along because we didn't have a choice and we were fine and we were successful. So whatever comes your way, you will be successful if you put the same amount of energy and devotion and effort into it, if that's what you really want to do. So what I always recommend is start by listing out your transferable skills. You have a lot of them. Consider what you love the most about teaching. Again, is that that aha moment? Is it making things? Is it the coaching after school? Is it um, making connections with the parents and problem solving? 
What is it that really, when you think about it, drove you to become a teacher in the first place? And what, when, when you think about your day, what is your bright spot? Okay, you really want to think about that, nail that down, because that's going to help you determine which of these paths or a completely different path is really right for you next. So I am going to send out this slide deck after. There's a couple links in here, 40 jobs for former teachers. There's, a, like I said, lots of options. Uh, from Teacher to ID, Christy Tucker's fantastic. There's also Devlin Peck. He has amazing resources out there. YouTube, 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 everything. It's amazing. It has everything on there. I'm also including a free interest profiler for you. Sometimes it's just helpful to take it out of context of teaching and just really figure out what you're interested in. Not what you have had to be interested in, but what you're actually interested in. Because it's, it's different, right? Okay, so what's your next steps? I'm going to drop uh, in the chat a link from for you, not from you. That would be pretty impressive if you were to you know, do that. Um, so this link is a checklist that I have made for you all. And so outline your passions and your skills. These are not limited to what you've done in teaching. They can be from other jobs. They can be from other hobbies or interests. Just objectively list out what you're good at. Are you good at planning things, organizing things, making things, what types of things, you know, that kind of stuff. Then map out your timeline to help hold yourself accountable. This is that uh, career change timeline template that I just dropped in the chat for you. You're more than welcome. Please make a copy. All of these are editable. And so, you know, it just says, by this date, I will do this. It holds yourself accountable. Type it in, print it out, put it on your fridge, put it somewhere that you look every day. If this is something that you're ready to commit to, commit to it. We're always more likely to commit to it if we're faced with it every day, right? You can add more of these in there if you like. Decide which career you want to focus on. Complete learning opportunities because regardless of which career you pick, for going to next. There are learning gaps. Those range from minimal, like the nanny, that's probably a pretty narrow learning gap there that you'd have to fill. Um, although I'm sure if, if you're like me, you'd have to brush up on your CPR. Um, <laughs> and maybe like the baby choking Heimlich thing. Um, but for like instructional design or project management, those kind of skills Teaching provides an excellent foundation, but it's not cumulative enough that it encompasses everything that you would need to do in the role. So it's important that you research and understand what, what comes next for that. And then it keeps going from there. This is important. I know I mentioned this earlier, but I will mention it again here. You need to create and optimize your LinkedIn. It's essentially Almost as important, if not more important nowadays, than a cover letter or even a resume. This is how corporate really finds candidates for their roles. Indeed, ZipRecruiter, Monster, those are places that you can go to get jobs. But all those jobs are also found on in, in LinkedIn and additional jobs. It's all in one place. You can upload your resume, they can see your profile, they can see what LinkedIn learnings you have done so that they can see, oh, they're continually learning. They see your professional connections, they see your activity, how much are you contributing to the community, what are you putting yourself out there for professionally. So if you think of all of your application documents like your resume, your uh, cover letter, now your LinkedIn profile. If you're going for user experience design or instructional designer, you'll need a portfolio, which is a body of work. Um, all of those you can think of as real estate. And you want all of your properties to offer something a little bit different, but also make you shine in a good way. right? And sign up for LinkedIn Premium. You get the first month free. Don't 
waste it. Don't waste that first month. You can take as many learnings as you want. You can upload them to your profile and that makes you more visible by recruiters. Do some e-learnings. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this yet, but I highly re recommend LinkedIn Learning. Uh, YouTube is great. There's also many, many, many free webinars and uh, different companies that offer free programs. There's also paid programs. If you would like some direction and some lists of what those are, we're happy to provide a list. Here at Teaching a Path to L&D, we neither encourage nor discourage the purchase of any program. We just encourage you to do your research. Go on Reddit. Talk to people who have been through the programs themselves. Get first-hand knowledge and experience. Talk to actually to the hiring managers and ask them, is this something that you would look for? Is this valuable on my resume? Would this hurt my resume? And there are things out there that have potential to go in the other direction. So it's important that you are researching your decisions very carefully. And then revamp your resume. You cannot use a blanket teacher resume to apply for these jobs. You must have a resume that is geared towards the job you want. It is okay to put that you have educator roles and to put the experience that you put, but you there are words that you need to learn how to incorporate, and you do that from doing these learnings. And if you Put out a resume that says, I am a teacher looking for a corporate trainer slash instructional designer slash project manager slash nobody is going to give you the time of day because to them, you haven't committed to the role. And if you haven't committed enough to make a, a focused resume, they're going to take that as you're not serious in applying and being a candidate for their role. So it is important that you have a focused resume. If you need help with that, we're more than happy to help with that. We'll take a look at it. We do offer resume workshops as well. I do have to get those two other recordings up on YouTube, but the first one's up there. The next two will be up hopefully by this weekend. So that's a great place to start. Okay. Can I you with some questions, Sarah? Yes, we're ready. We're at Q&A. If you have to drop, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you can stay and listen and learn and, you know, just connect with people, we'd love to have you. So go ahead, Erin. I'm sorry. Oh, let me drop, um, let me drop the networking Google Doc in yep. the chat, in the chat box. Um, if you guys want to, if we want to network with each other and share some information, um, how to get in touch with each other, that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to drop that in the chat box now. And, um. Sarah, can I hit you with some questions that came up in the past, like, five minutes? Hit me, baby, one more time. <laughs> yeah. All right, Musical about silence. LinkedIn. Do you include every employment experience you've ever had or just what's relevant? That's a really great question. Um, I would say... I would say keep it to what's relevant. Uh, the less that they have to sort through, the better. Recruiters, when they look at your resume, take anywhere from 30 seconds to a little bit more. If they really like what they're seeing, they'll spend an extra 30 seconds. So that's 60 seconds to dress to impress, if you will. Uh, same thing for your LinkedIn profile. If they don't find what they need in the first couple of glances, they're going to ignore the rest. So if the good stuff is buried in between a whole bunch of stuff that isn't helpful or, or useful to the role that you're going after, I would say leave it out. If you are pursuing different options that have like different work experiences contribute in different ways to those, I would say then put it up there. At the end of the day, it's up to you. And that's with any type of application document, resume, cover letter, LinkedIn, everybody and their mom is going to have an opinion about what you should do and what you should put on it. And it's going to conflict with somebody else's opinion. So at the end of the day, you're going to take all that in. You're going to keep what resonates with you and you're going to discard what doesn't. And you're going to trust your gut because your gut got you this far in life. It'll get you further. I promise. So that's what I would say to that. Great question. 